Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar titled The Bigger Picture, How Global Climate Research Impacts Ohio. With that, I will now turn it over to Scott Miller, Director of CE3. Thank you, Matt. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Ohio University's Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to the third installment of our 2014 Energy Webinar Series. As Matt said, my name is Scott Miller, and I'm the director of the school's Consortium for Energy, Economics, and the Environment, which is also known as CE3. Today's webinar, which is entitled The Bigger Picture, How Climate Change Impacts Ohio, takes us full circle back to where we began this series, the challenges and opportunities of facing climate change head on in an industrialized Midwestern state like Ohio. Over the last three years, we've explored a wide-ranging set of topics, including industrial energy efficiency, shale gas production, emissions from landfills, agricultural energy options, and last month we discussed the major structural changes that are coming to Ohio's electricity markets. Today's topic was spurred by the findings of the recently released report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also known as the IPCC Working Group 2, and their contributions to the fifth assessment report, which was released publicly about two weeks ago. All of this work is made possible through a grant from the US EPA to help Ohio facilities better understand their compliance obligations through their emissions reporting programs. The major grant activities for this project include workshops and webinars such as this one to inform Ohio industry on current trends in Ohio's energy markets and how changes in these markets may change emissions. Also under the grant, Ohio University recently updated our statewide emissions database that was used to create the state's climate action plan, which is posted on US EPA's website now. And as always, all of our events and project work, as well as the downloadable version of this webinar, can be found on our website, www.ohio.edu backslash CE3, the number three. I have several logistical responsibilities in opening up today's meeting. First, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to our extremely strong panel of speakers today. We hope that you enjoy the dialogue, and I feel sure that you're going to take something useful away from today's meeting. Second, if you have a question that you'd like to submit to our panelists on our staff uh, or our staff during the session, we ask that you use the question field on the GoToWebinar navigation pane on the right-hand side of your screen to type a question for our panelists. We're going to try to get to as many of those questions as possible during our time together today. And finally, a link to a brief online evaluation is going to be emailed to you after the webinar. Please take a few minutes to provide us with feedback of today's session so that we can learn how to improve uh, future webinars in, uh, in the future. And with that, I believe I've covered all of my logistical bases. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, my colleague, Dr. Jeff DeBelko. Jeff joined the faculty of the Voinovich School two years ago after having spent the previous 14 years with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., where he was the director of the Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. Mm -hmm. His former program is a nonpartisan research policy forum on energy, population, health, development, and security issues that brings together policymakers, practitioners, journalists, and scholars who are grappling with the complex linkages between environment, population, development, conflict, and security. Jeff's current research focuses on climate change, natural resources, and security, as well as environmental pathways to confidence building and peace building with a special emphasis on water resources. Jeff has held prior positions with the Council on Foreign Relations and Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, most uh, relevant to our discussion today, Jeff recently served as the lead author on the IPCC Working Group 2, Chapter 12 on Human Security. So I think you're going to agree with me that we have a very qualified and capable moderator for our discussion today. So I'm going to step out of the way and turn this webinar over to Jeff and our panelists. Uh, Jeff, will you please take it away? Sure thing, Scott. Thank you so very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, really just uh, direct traffic for what is an outstanding panel that will allow us to take advantage of the release of this new IPCC report, look at what um, the state of the science says regarding climate change, and then um, bring that down through kind of key uh, lenses for, for Ohio. Um, and so uh, just a couple words on IPCC, and, and, and then we'll, we'll dive right into it. Uh, so this is a, it's not new research. It's a bringing together uh, world's leading scientists to assess 
the state of the science, to have an understanding from, from the peer-reviewed literature, um, what it is we know and, and where, where are we going. Um, and then the, what we're doing now is um, um, trying to um, dig into that rich report uh, that had over 2,000 reviewers from 84 mm -hmm. countries, 50,000 different comments that uh, were responded to in the full four-year process of putting this together, uh, but pull out key themes and then start having a discussion about what it means for um, um, specific places and people in the public and the private sector uh, to, to take those issues into account. Uh, so some of the bottom lines for the report, the impacts are now, not just a set of challenges for the future. Climate has often been framed as a, as a future issue that's coming, and I think the, definitively the report says that we're experiencing it now, and, and so now is the time to, to be responding to it. Uh, that no one is immune, uh, that this uh, has impacts for everyone, rich and poor, rural and urban, coastal and inland, dry and wet, mountainous or plains, these are, um, uh, these are a set of issues that we all are, uh, have to grapple with. Uh, there are definitely different risks and different changes in different locales, and so it does really matter where you're talking about. Um, but in many ways, climate adaptation is something that's underway, so it's not something we're starting from scratch. But in many cases, we aren't uh, particularly well prepared for the climate-related risks that we face. and that. Uh, better preparation can really pay dividends for both the present uh, as well as the future. So to get a sense of what was uh, in the report and then specifically in the North American chapter and bringing it down to the Midwest and ultimately Ohio, we really do have an outstanding panel. We're going to start with um, uh, Dr. Patty romero Lenkeo, who's a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. Uh, uh, Patty was one of the coordinating lead authors, so the kind of two chairs of the uh, committee that uh, wrote the North America chapter on this I IPCC report. So it'll be terrific to have her give us the, the lay of the land. Um, commissioner Paula Brooks is a, a commissioner in Franklin County, uh, someone who's uh, put sustainability and, and these issues at the centerpiece of the initiative she's done. She's also a member of President Obama's Climate Preparedness and Resilience Task Force, advising the president along with um, uh, folks from across the country in, in kind of key roles, the practitioner and governing roles um, for our states and our cities uh, to talk about these issues through that lens. And then finally, Tom Henry is a an award-winning uh, uh, journalist in writing on environment and energy at the Toledo Blade, and will give us that lens um, in terms of how journalists are seeing big reports like these and the many themes and extracting what it means for um, the readership of uh, a paper here in Ohio. So Patty, we'll, we'll start with you, and um, I see your slides have come up. We'll throw it to you for your remarks, and we'll uh, go to Commissioner Brooks, and then we'll go to Tom, and then we'll have opportunity for discussion in the end. Folks who are um, uh, attending, please feel free at any time to send a question, and I'll try to uh, get those together and, and, and be ready for our discussion period. So uh, Dr. romero uh, the why don't I turn it over to you? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let me start by telling you uh, some words on what is different and helpful and relevant about this working group to report. What is different, I mean, three things are different. First, we do not only focus on heat waves, flooding, sea level rise, and other global and distant climate trends and impacts, but we have a lot of scientific uh, knowledge on what their immediate effects are on infrastructures, economic activities, rural and urban settlements, human health, water resources, and other things we humans value. Uh, the second, um, I mean, our report has two more additional inno innovations. The first is, uh, can you please move to the next slide? <laughs> the, the first one is a risk approach to assessing climate adaptation impacts and vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. please. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, what, by this we mean that we are not only exploring what is the probability and what are the impacts uh, 
climate change or a, a change in climate will bring to us, but we also are bringing social and physical scientists to assess the knowledge on what factors make some places and people more vulnerable to these impacts, who is more exposed and why. And, and this is a third innovation, we also provide a careful analysis of adaptation limits, meaning uh, uh, obstacles that we cannot overcome, and I will come to that at the end of my presentation, barriers. Uh, we, these are obstacles that we can overcome, and what are also the adaptation potentials. So, uh, uh, in short, this report is different in these three ways. Uh, the next slide, please. So, our first key finding is that the observed climate impacts are widespread and consequential. Uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, so, some of these, uh, as you can see in this map, some of these impacts, these uh, patterns of impacts uh, in recent decades are, uh, have been attributed to climate change based on studies published since the AR4, which was published in 2007. So, uh, we also found that the evidence of climate change impacts is strongest and most comprehensive for natural systems, which are the blue and the green ones in this map. And um, uh, we also have found that some of these impacts uh, on human systems can also be attributed to climate change, and some that are relevant for North America are impacts of climate change in uh, agriculture, on agriculture. Uh, next slide. We also have evaluated, uh, uh, evaluated all these impacts at different scales and for the different regions of the world. Uh, so this is really a very unique uh, um, uh, map. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, as can be seen in this assessment of many studies covering a wide range of regions and crops, the negative impacts of climate change on crop yields have been more common than the positive impacts, and this is different to the prior report. We have found that climate change has negatively affected wheat and uh, maize yields for many regions and in the global aggregate. That has not been necessarily the case for soy. Um, so, uh, next one, please. Uh, so, this is about impacts for the globe, but uh, in our North American uh, report chapter, we found also uh, and we, uh, uh, that there have been impacts such as increases in heat waves, increases in heavy precipitation, decreases in frost days, earlier peak of snow melt runoff, and declines in snow path. And all these impacts are of relevance for many of the activities and the things we humans value, such as health, water resources, uh, and also energy uh, systems. Next one, please. Um, so, Another, this is our three key message, people, societies, and ecosystems around the world are vulnerable and exposed in different ways. And here I really want to emphasize that we have the idea that only people in Africa or in Central America are vulnerable because they lack resources such as infrastructures, institutional support, governmental policies, but as can be seen in the next slide, um, and this is a map we put uh, together for the North American chapter, this figure here offers a graphic illustration of location of extreme events and relevant vulnerability trends. The observed extreme events, uh, such as drought, fire, flood, and hurricanes, have not been attributed to uh, climate change, to anthropogenic climate change, yet, and this is a key message for the U.S. and for North America, these are 
climate sensitive sources of impact illustrating the vulnerability of exposed systems. And we need to pay attention to this, particularly if projected future increases in the frequency or intensity of such events should materialize. Uh, the, the first, the, the map on the bottom shows exposure, so it is a population density. The map on the top uh, has significant weather events taking place during 1993 and 2013. The map only includes disasters with overall losses of more than one billion U.S. dollars. Um, for, for the U.S., this is 2012 dollars. And the little uh, um, four panels on the right show some trends in indicators of vulnerability, such as poverty rates, percentage of the elderly who are most sensitive to these extremes, uh, GDP and total populations. The next, uh, please. Um, so, not everything is bad news. We also have um, shown, uh, found that adaptation is already happening, uh, that adaptation is accumulating across regions in the public, the private sector, and within communities, as can be seen in the, this and the next two slides. We have found for North America and this is against uh, the public perception that the U.S. is doing nothing. No, it's not true. U.S. is doing a lot. Governments, particularly at the local and state level, but also at the national level, are already developing adaptation plans and policies and integrating climate change considerations into their development goals. Uh, so. Um, of course, adaptations are faced with barriers. Uh, we found that uh, decision makers face challenges and sources of resistance, um, not only at the planning but also at the implementation stage. Uh, a key challenge is the, uh, the uh, information, scientific information. Uh, another key challenge is lack of institutional, financial, and human resources, and in many cases also uh, lack of political will. Um, the next one, please. So the barriers are uh, obstacles that we can overcome, but if we don't do anything, uh, the next uh, slide, please, if we don't do anything to respond to the challenges of climate change, then we will face with limits. And this is a new concept of key relevance for decision makers in Ohio, in Colorado, everywhere in the U.S. The message is that increasing magnitudes of warming increase the likelihood of severe and pervasive impacts. And this uh, brings me to close uh, this presentation with some thoughts. The first refers to a notion we develop in our group. We call the time between now and 2050 the era of climate responsibility. This means that we have a closing window of opportunity to mitigate this means to reduce emissions by between 40 percent and 70 percent. Um, we also need to adapt because we already committed our climate system to changes that we cannot stop even if we were to reduce emissions by 100 percent. So this means that we need to climate proof our infrastructures to develop effective emergency response systems that allowed us to better respond to disasters we all are experiencing uh, in the U.S. and in the world. Um, but this is not enough. We see uh, the, the, the next slide, please. Um, we will see in the next slide that after the, the next, please, and with this, uh, yeah. So you can see here on the left side how it is after 2050 that our uh, climate scenarios show uh, divergent and different 
uh, pathways. So what we do today to mitigate and to adapt, we have implications that we will see exactly in this uh, cutting point. So just now we have their responsibility to reduce emissions and to adapt to climate change. If we don't do so, and this you see on the right side of this figure, we will be faced with um, more, uh, uh, more uh, threats to our unique systems, more extreme weather events, uh, more impacts that will mostly affect for sure the poor and the marginalized, but will also be uh, uh, felt by the wealthy. Uh, and uh, to the right side you see that if we don't do anything, the, the, the risk of large scale singular events will be higher. So uh, to close uh, this presentation, I, and, and this is the next and I think last slide, I want to say that before that, well, this is another one which is a, a very nice study showing how if we don't reduce emissions, uh, the possibilities of having negative impacts on, a, on agriculture as measured by a, a years, the negative impacts will be higher than the positive impacts. So again, we are affecting even food, food security, a key element for people, a key basic element for people. So again, if we don't do anything now to adapt and to mitigate, we will be faced with huge challenges. And again, with this I really want to close this presentation by saying that after participating in this report, I came up with what I call a guarded optimism. I see that we have options to mitigate, to reduce emissions, and to adapt to climate change. We have win-win opportunities, but we have also a closing window of opportunity. We, the U.S., can use to continue being leaders at the state, national, and global level. But again, the window is closing, and I hope that we all, I mean, we as academics, as scientists, the public, decision makers work to, to show that ability to innovate that has always been a fascinating, fascinating characteristic of the U.S. and be leaders globally in this huge effort. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, Dr. Romero Lenteo, as I mentioned up front, is a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and heads up their uh, heads up their urban studies initiative. Um, we're going to turn now to uh, Paula Brooks, who is a Franklin County Commissioner. Has served there since she was elected in 2004. Uh, she's been the chair of the board three times. Uh, she's Franklin County, as I think many of our participants know, uh, includes the capital of Columbus here in Ohio. It's the 30th largest county in the country. Um, she has made sustainability initiatives really a cornerstone of her efforts in office. She's chair of the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Steering Committee and the Energy Renewable Subcommittee, um, vice chair of the Public-Private Green Government Initiative. And then in 2013, uh, Commissioner Brooks was appointed to President Obama's Climate Preparedness and Resilience Task Force, where she's joining 25 other governors, mayors, county officials, tribal leaders throughout the nation, uh, serving on that task force, um, also their subgroup on built systems, uh, and uh, lead for the energy sector, as well as the natural resources and agriculture subgroup. So uh, Commissioner Brooks, we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. DeBelco, for inviting me today. And I'd also thank you for your excellent work on environment and security. Um, I'd also uh, like to express my appreciation to your colleagues, uh, Scott Miller, Alyssa Welsh, and Matt Trainer, for their work with the CE3's webinar series. This is fantastic and a great way to uh, get the word out about these incredibly important issues uh, to the state of Ohio and its um, residents. 
Um, I think we're having um, a bit of a technical issue here, but I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, try to start and maybe ask that uh, Matt control the slides. Could we go to the first slide, please? While he's doing that, I'll just um, give you a little background. As we all know, uh, Franklin County is the capital of Ohio. Uh, Columbus uh, is our uh, state capital city, and Franklin County is our state uh, capital county. Um, we really began this journey in 2006. I was a new commissioner beginning in 2005, and of course the Iraq War was raging then. Uh, we we're very concerned about um, uh, energy independence, uh, but also as commissioners around the country uh, know and around our state know, uh, we are always concerned about uh, saving dollars. So I have to be frank with you, um, uh, growing up on a farm in a frugal environment and never wasting anything, that was kind of my background and I think as commissioners that's how uh, we have um, always proceeded uh, to save dollars first. So. In 2000, uh, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Great. We'll go to the next one. In 2006, uh, we took the step of becoming one of the first counties in the country to develop a resolution that guided our finances, um, and that was 68306. We said we could do both. We could be sustainable and be a progressive uh, economic uh, growth community. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that as of uh, 2012, we are now the fastest growing county in Ohio, so I'd say that policy has worked. Uh, we have embedded the, um, the policy and practice of sustainability into every agency's budget, and their approval of their budget is con contingent upon reporting that every year. So uh, we promote the purchase and use of products. Um, uh, we uh, develop waste management policies that are consistent with that. And we also have developed fleet management tools that assist with um, air quality. Um, next slide, please. We've also taken this uh, to the next level and uh, have developed very detailed green initiative contract language uh, for all pur purchases over $25,000. We manage a $1.3 billion budget. So that's a lot of money and a lot of buying power that we can leverage towards sustainability. Uh, we use uh, tracking tools, like making sure that um, uh, certain uh, certifications are connected to the products and services that we, um, uh, that we, have, uh, that we are, are purchasing, so that we know that we have guidelines and something uh, that is solid to rely on. Next slide, please. Um, we, of course, in, in, uh, two, in, in 2008, like many uh, businesses and governments, uh, uh, have strong policies on not wasting paper and conserving. We also, in uh, 2007, adopted a non-idling policy for all of our county vehicles uh, because we noticed then the impact of climate on uh, air quality attainment, and we still struggle with that as a large urban county. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've decided to uh, retrofit many of our county buildings. Uh, I remember listening to Dr. Stephen Chu when he was a new leader of the uh, U.S. Energy Department in 2006, and he uh, told us that the single largest uh, contribution we could make around the country was making sure that we were insulating facilities. We've taken those steps uh, here with our county campuses, uh, and as you can see on the slide, we have many buildings uh, that uh, we manage. But in addition, we've also managed dollars for the federal government through CDBG uh, and helped individual uh, citizens and residents um, insulate their property, sa saving money, putting people to work, uh, and also, we hope, having a positive climate impact. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, and I think we'll skip to the next one, um, this is more of our purchasing uh, 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 program. We also uh, have converted our, our fleet uh, to, uh, again, uh, reach air quality attainment goals. We know that asthma rates are higher in our urban areas, including in Franklin County, so we've moved to E85 and biodiesel fuel. 
Um, there's also an energy independence aspect there. Uh, we also just bought our first diesel hybrid, and we're very excited about that. We use our waste oil from county vehicles to operate building heating uh, and save on our natural gas. Um, and you'll see reflected throughout our purchases, again, uh, using that purchasing power, uh, recycled material and a very significant level. Next slide, please. We believe in LEED. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned previously, we took seriously Dr. Chu's challenge uh, to uh, conserve energy uh, and to, uh, again, improve our um, air quality thereby. And we also have found that it saves us money. We built the only LEED Gold Courthouse in the Midwest. Uh, it was a $110 million project, and we're saving 25% on our energy costs. Uh, we have uh, removed the lighting. Uh, from the grid on our new dog shelter, which is state-of-the-art throughout the country, uh, and it is at a lead silver level. We're very proud of that. Uh, next slide, please. We've also engaged um, in uh, energy savings uh, through becoming an alternative energy county and implementing uh, solar arrays on a downtown uh, urban building and assisting the city of Columbus in the largest uh, solar arrays in the state of Ohio among local governments. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'll just briefly touch on this. We believe that zero waste is achievable, and we've worked through our Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio to take uh, municipal solid waste and convert it into CNG which, as we all know, and we heard President Obama say, is a, great, is a good bridge fuel uh, into the future. Uh, we will uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, I was uh, deeply honored to be appointed to President Obama's Task Force on Climate Preparedness and Resilience. Uh, we're uh, moving very rapidly to get a report on the President's death by November 11th. Next slide, please. This task force, I would emphasize, is bipartisan. Uh, there are 26 of us throughout the U.S., and uh, we are all working very well together, uh, and uh, we seem to be mostly on the same page. Uh, next slide, please. We are staffed uh, by the, uh, the agencies you see in the red box on the slide, but in addition to that, the National Security Director uh, and national security staff have also been attending our meetings. This is a national security issue. Next slide, please. The task force uh, is grouped into subgroups. Uh, I serve on the built systems, and I'm also leading the energy sector with uh, the mayor of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we are also grouped, and I'm serving on the Natural Resources and Agriculture uh, subgroup, and we've had a great deal of discussion there on food security, a very important issue, even to Ohio. Um, and we're actually looking at how o ocean acidification is linked to our food supply in Ohio. There's also a disaster preparedness uh, and a human health and community development um, uh, subgroup. Next slide, please. As you can see, our mission is focused on federal government action. Our mission is to uh, come up with ways that the federal government right now can remove barriers, create incentives, and modernize federal programs uh, to, to get us ready for and make us resilient from the climate impacts that uh, Dr. Romero Blanqueo um, uh, discussed earlier. The president has said we must come up with ideas that won't cost more tax dollars. Uh, that's quite a challenge, but we're doing it. Next slide, please. We know as local elected officials throughout the nation, especially county commissioners, are on the front line. Um, and we have emergency management agency uh, responsibilities. We know that the weather is getting more severe and it's getting uh, more frequent in, in terms of uh, what's happening. And I've had conversations with our Ohio utility companies. They have their own meteorologists, and they are telling me the exact same thing. Uh, we don't want to see that lower right-hand slide occur any more than we can possibly uh, mit uh, uh, avoid. Uh, it's just terrible seeing our children impacted by the severe weather. Next slide, please. The good news. There are new federal action and tools uh, that are coming forward out of this task force uh, effort. 
as you can see there, um, there's a new site, climate.data.gov. I would encourage your uh, viewers and listeners today to visit. Um, and uh, that has been put together by NOAA and will be very valuable to those of us at the local level uh, who prepare for and we hope make us resilient from these climate impacts. Next slide, please. Um, also, uh, this is another uh, indication of, a, of, a, of an action tool, ncdc.noaa.gov. Um, take a moment and uh, look at that. Again, this is helping all of us in the emergency management uh, areas around the, around the, the state and nation uh, to get better prepared. Uh, these are huge investments that we have to make with those $1.3 billion just in our county. Uh, we want to make sure that we're spending those money wisely and our investments uh, truly have to be connected with climate change and what we know will have to be invested in the infrastructure in the future. I'll skip over this one. Um, there are new methane emissions and uh, 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 guidances that are coming out from the federal government. I would encourage folks to take a look at those as well. Our timeline, our timeline is quick. Next, line, next slide, please. Um, we must have a final report on the President's desk uh, uh, by the end of November of this year. He's serious about that. There won't be any extensions. Uh, so we need your input right now so that we can incorporate that into everything that we're doing. And we're drafting language right now as we speak. We have experts um, on governmental staff throughout the country who work for people like me, including uh, Bart here and Brooke here, sitting with me today. And uh, next slide, please. This is how you can help. We need your fresh ideas. Um, we need you to log in uh, to the White House uh, website or to my uh, website at Franklin County. You can see it listed there on the uh, webinar slides. Uh, your ideas truly do matter. We've gotten some great ones already from around the state of Ohio. Uh, next slide, please. I appeal to your viewers and listeners to act now for our future generations. That's um, the Beaver Creek State Park, where I grew up, nine generations of us in Columbiana County, Ohio. After 2050, will this forest be here? I hope so. And I really appreciate your help today and your focus on this incredibly important issue. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Brooks. I really appreciate it, as um, introduced at the beginning. Uh, Commissioner Paula Brooks from Franklin County and also uh, part of President Obama's Climate Preparedness and Resilience Task Force. So thank you so much uh, for those um, really practical examples of how in many ways the lessons are being learned from this scientific understanding of the uh, climate changes that are happening and are coming and finding ways to in very practical sense um, position ourselves on the adaptation front uh, as well as on the mitigation front in terms of trying to bend the curve and, and reduce the problem that's, uh, that's uh, driving these changes. Uh, so we're going to turn now to Tom Henry, who is a, a journalist, a staff writer at the Toledo Blade, somebody who's been covering energy and environmental issues uh, for decades. Um, Tom is a member and a former board member of uh, the Society of Environmental Journalists, which is really, frankly, the premier um, association of environmental journalists in the United States, an incredibly valuable group, and highly recommend their annual meetings if you haven't had a chance to, to attend them. Lots to learn at them. Uh, Tom has uh, been uh, on a Clippinger Fellowship in Public Affairs reporting at Ohio State University. Um, and has had his work recognized by uh, a whole raft of top media and science media outlets. Uh, just recently, he also served as an advisor for a, a big Great Lakes climate change communication outreach project uh, that was funded by the National Science Foundation and undertaken by seven of the universities uh, surrounding the Great Lakes. So, Tom, why don't we uh, turn it over to you? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to try to step back for a moment here and give you the media perspective of, of uh, how and why and some of the challenges and frustrations we have in, in covering 
climate change. During my career, I've seen this issue evolve where uh, scientists themselves, it seemed like, were kind of a little, you know, um, I don't want to say nervous, but, but you know, taking it easy, how, how strongly they come out to, to now where there's certainly a very uh, strong uh, consensus, a slam dunk, if you will. But journalists, too, in our nation's newsrooms, uh, people didn't really at first, back you know, when James Hansen was first testifying before Congress, really didn't you know, get into talking as much about the uh, uh, realities of climate change as they are now and accepting it. Uh, I, and journalists have had a discussion with scientists about this before where, to some degree, science Science has to take some responsibility in that because they've scientists uh, for a long time have felt that they could step back and let the science, the pure science, rise to the top, and that that would win out, and people would recognize, you know, that this this phenomenon is true, and that hasn't really happened. It's still very political, which just shows you sometimes how. Uh, unscientific we are as a society and what we are you know willing or not willing to believe um, I'm not going to go into the poles of belief because it doesn't really doesn't really matter what we believe I mean science is going to be science science is going to happen whether we believe in it or not so um, it, it's still but it still is a very uh, interesting story to me because if you if you take a minute to think about it Climate change is a very far-reaching, nebulous story, um, a real obscure con concept to some people that, that is hard for journalists to localize, especially in these days of staffing cutbacks and less uh, science-savvy journalists out there. And as was, as was said earlier, it used to be thought of as a futuristic story, but it's not anymore. The challenge is to make connections uh, to more than just major wildlife symbols, such as the polar bear. That's why I tell people sometimes, you know, it's uh, you know, it's not the polar bear, stupid. It's people. You know, uh, journalists struggle to get people to understand the importance of rising sea levels, more hurricanes, more dramatic storm events, um, and there are there are trade-offs uh, to this. To this uh, everywhere, as 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 you know, it's uh, it's it's something that uh, you know we're we're working on trying to trying to bring the, the this far-reaching global climate story home to show people how it affects them uh, more in their everyday lives, and a lot of that comes down to how it affects them in their pocketbooks. Um, could I have a next slide, please? So there's there's a lot of um, definite impacts, especially for the Great Lakes region. I focus in the Great Lakes region, obviously, because uh, Toledo's in uh, the Western Lake Erie region, the most sensitive part of the Great Lakes region, the warmest, the shallowest, most biologically productive. We're in a very re unique area, uh, a great convergence of some of the world's top agriculture and you know, some of the world's top uh, um, uh, industry uh, manufacturing here, the auto industry. I mean, the, the whole industrial revolution uh, is, is rooted uh, here in the Great Lakes region. And, and so there's a great convergence between how climate affects uh, the shorelines, the water quality, the water quantity, farming, industry, and, and other things like that. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Joel Sherega, uh with the US EPA, who's one of the, he might be the chairman of, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the umbrella organization that uh, involves uh, officials from um, each of the major federal agencies on climate change. Uh, but you know, he he's told me that the Great Lakes region is one of the most intensely studied and uh, the one where they're seeing the most acute effects of climate change now, because of you know all the all the different uh, dynamic uh, dynamics that are going on here. Uh, according to the latest 
IPCC report that Scott is here today. There are there are a number of things that that have been reported before in the press that I think that were amplified a little more, um, such as there there could be less hydropower uh, if water levels go down. Uh, navigation could be hindered by flooding. Uh, there will be likely greater shipping costs from lower lake levels, more trips necessary to haul the same cargo, which you know is going to drive up the cost for uh, for commerce in, in uh, this part of the country. Uh, there will also be huge impacts on agriculture, food production, forestry, forestry, invasive species, wildlife, public health, smog, and water. Uh, not only the quantity, but the quantity of water. Um, and water and agriculture obviously is a huge issue. Uh, uh, even here in the water water rich uh, Great Lakes region, um, already a lot of other parts of the country and the world are looking at are looking to this area for more agricultural production, and that puts more stress on on this region and on the yields and and how. Uh, how land is used and what that means to uh, to runoff and and the runoff that can lead to uh, more toxic algae in Western Lake Erie. In fact, Canada's ambassador to the United States said recently, uh, it's called caused a kind of a stir in Canada, and I had it on my blog that uh, that he anticipates diplomatic tensions between the United States and Canada to to be rising over the next four, uh, five years. Could I uh, have the next slide, please? So droughts, flooding, and here in Western Lake Erie, algae. This, this is a algae known as microcystis, and it has a, a toxin in it called microcystin that uh, killed 75 people in Brazil in the, uh, in the late 90s. Uh, in that case, it, it breached uh, and got, got into a... Um, a water filtration system of the kidney dialysis center. So people who were patients who were, you know, at risk for uh, being exposed to contaminated water got kind of the worst case scenario there. Uh, but but still, the point is that you know this is a very serious toxin. It can make you it can make you sick, give you you know stomach cramps, diarrhea, and the whole bit. Um, or in large enough doses. Uh, uh, you know, can kill you. Uh, uh, it's been just more is being learned about it now. Uh, there's algae problems all over the world, but uh, in this particular case, uh, this type of toxin uh, has been known to be more more toxic than arsenic, and uh, uh, and it um, you know, and it's it's a serious issue now. It's gaining a lot of attention uh, because it's affecting our property values. It's affecting our recreation, our tourism. And it's exacerbated, most likely exacerbated by climate change because of, you know, how that affects the uh, the um, major uh, major storms, the frequency, the duration of storms, especially between March 1st and June 30th. That's the time frame scientists have, have identified as most critical to trying to prevent runoff of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and other nutrients that help make this algae grow. Um, next slide, slide, please. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, though, briefly, is um, a lot of times we, we, we look at the, at the worst case scenarios, the headlines, the drama of you know, where's the next Hurricane Sandy or the next Hurricane Katrina, or what is, um, you know, what's what's devastating us? Where where is the, you know, where are places being inundated uh, with uh, rising sea levels, and you know, the drama of climate change to try because that's human nature. People want to know what's the worst case scenario and how do you, uh, you know, how do you get that point across? I just kind of poking around uh, this winter, everybody here, and I mean everybody, everybody was upset about potholes. I mean, they just were everywhere uh, coming up earlier than usual, deeper than usual. We had city officials who were just completely overwhelmed. 
uh, getting yelled at by everyone to work faster, and and city officials saying they hadn't seen them uh, this deep, um, uh, this deep and this uh, you know this this prevalent in a long time. And I you know I talked to some people, and if you accept that now, I mean, climate and weather obviously are two different things, uh, but but still, if you accept that through climate change you're going to probably have more rapid freezes and thaws. I think sometimes we focus too much on when we look at climate like yearly averages and and where does the needle move for long range as we should because climate is more of a long range phenomenon. But if it's triggering, you know, some more rapid freezes and thaws, then this is potentially, I'm not saying it is, but potentially one of the hidden costs of climate change could be more potholes and um, deeper and more frequent, uh, you know, and it's something right there. People, unfortunately, in our society don't identify that much with, you know, people at risk in the small South Pacific island of uh, uh, Kiribati or, or Bangladesh um, who are in deep trouble from rising sea levels, but everybody uses roads to get to and from work and to run their errands and everything else, and that they'll tell you about the major pothole that you got to avoid or you're going to have suspension problems with your car, and, you know, it, it's just something to think about in the back of your mind. Is this one of the hidden costs of climate change that, um, that you know, could potentially motivate people to take it a little more seriously, because that's one of the one of the key things is trying to get people to take it more seriously. Uh, next, next slide, please, Matt. And a lot of the talk this winter, uh, you know, is about the polar vortex. It, it's it's not a um, not a new phenomenon, as we all know. Uh, despite what Rush, Rush Limbaugh said, the media did not create the term just out of its own convenience to try to brainwash people about, uh, uh, about uh, climate change. Uh, the American Meteorological Society's glossary that was first published, I want to say in uh, 1947, but it might have, I might have my year wrong, it's either the late 40s or early 50s. I had this in the story I, I did this winter, um, had the term polar vortex uh, there. It's, um, you know, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, we got the brunt of it. We got the brunt of it this year, and and it's something that um, you know that people are looking at. Uh, and how does this? And, and and it's going to affect our perceptions here in North America of uh, of climate change this, this winter. I mean, a lot of people don't still probably don't realize or can't accept that 2013 was the fourth war warmest uh, uh, year on record globally. And that includes with you know record highs in Australia and the Pacific Northwest and uh, South America. And a lot of times we forget that climate change is um, it's a global phenomenon. That it's not you know what we what we remembered happening in our backyard uh, two weeks ago. Um, next slide, please. And. Um, This was a this was a graphic from a story uh, that I did this this winter too. Uh, to me, one of the fascinating things about climate change isn't isn't just all of the obvious stories that you know how does it affect agriculture, how does it affect um, uh, wildlife and invasive species, and there there are many and countless ones like that 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 have subtle effects. But one of the emerging areas that haven't, haven't really gotten a lot of study and some psychologists I talked to this winter, uh, the psychology of climate change, how is it affecting us? I mean, are we, there, there's a theory that the rough winter we had this year, um, to, to some of us, was actually something we enjoyed more than we realized, that it took us back to the 60s, the 70s, or when we grew up and reminded us what winters are really like after several years of very mild winters. To me personally, just, um, you know, 
major thunderstorms in February are weird. Uh, and, and, you know, some of these psychologists were saying that uh, uh, there is something about appealing to a sense of familiarity that, uh, that uh, for some people, even, even harsh weather, uh, uh, major snowstorms can have a little more of a calming effect on them than, than unusual um, spotty, you know, herky-jerky type of uh, weather patterns. Um, and I know people kind of laughed and had a good time with that, but uh, there's also the, uh, and, well, first of all, there's, there's a question of are we adapting to a new norm with climate change? Is the next generation, the generation after that, are their expectations for winter going to be different than they are uh, for their parents and grandparents? Um, but also, how does that potentially affect the um, well-established known uh, um, phenomenon such as season, seasonal depression. This, this graphic in front of you here is not a new one. This has been, uh, that was developed I think about 20 years ago. Uh, but it's, it's a very strong, as you can see from looking at the colors, a very strong correlation of latitude there and how that may be affected uh, by, um, by climate change gradually, gradually in the future is, is you know, a good a good thing that uh, research, researchers are, are looking into now. Um, next slide, please. So that's, that's my contact information, how to uh, get a hold of me. I, um, uh, I know it's, very it's a very challenging issue, and, and a lot of journalists I know are, uh, are continually trying to look for ways to uh, you know, to, to find new angles to try to hook people into the story. Well, terrific, Tom. Thank you so much. Well, you've certainly given us some of the, the specifics and ways you, you have tackled that with the examples you've given, given and there are certainly stories that you've written behind um, some of those. And so uh, thank you for that lens uh, as well. I've got a number of questions, many of which I would um, uh, be appropriate for all of you, um, and we can start perhaps with one that um, that I do think you'd all have something to say uh, about. You've all worked with some comments covering them. Uh, Commissioner Brooks as a as a fellow uh, decision maker at the local levels, and and uh, Dr. Romeo Linkeo, you've you've worked with decision makers at local, national, and international levels. So in your experiences, the um, question I'd like to know, what has been um, the common denominators or, or what is it about approaches of cities or companies or counties or states where you see evidence of people effectively integrating this climate science or the understanding of, of climate impacts into their decision making? So what is it that um, people are doing or understanding or what is it that's making them take these issues uh, into account in, in real ways and some of the examples that we've heard today? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can answer that. Uh, what I have seen in many cities um, in Asia, in Latin America and in the Americas is that once decision makers and stakeholders see that climate change matters to them, not the, not to the polar bears, that's why I kept saying the polar bears is us. Uh, once we realize that, once we see that climate change affects our business, our health, then we take it more seriously. And as uh, uh, brilliantly described by Polar Brooks. Then we try to see, okay, how can we introduce actions in the health, the, the, the economic, the water sector to address this issue and do it in such a way that we save dollar, dollars and we show our taxpayers that what we are doing has win-win options. And I have th seen this happening in cities as diverse as Boulder, Seattle, um, uh, Durban in Africa, Mexico City, and you won't believe it, 
as huge as that city is, is also doing a lot uh, to, to respond to this challenge. So uh, we need to make uh, or to show, and I think that uh, uh, Tom here really did a great job there, to show what climate change means for us here and now. And then decision makers and stakeholders really take it more seriously because it really affects their stakes. Mm -hmm. And Patty, can I ask a follow-up? From your sense, is this time around with the with the IPCC report, is there a, a different um, perspective or strategy on sharing the insights of, of the new um, new report in ways that will make it easier for uh, people at these different levels of decision making to to take that information on? In some ways, like the the, the data, climate data uh, website that uh, Commissioner Brooks highlighted? Yes, I, I think that what is uh, innovative in our report is that we are not only uh, uh, coming with data on how climate hazards behave, right, heat waves behave, etc., but also uh, coming with data and options on how humans perceive, respond, react to these challenges and what could be done to be more effective. So we, the, the combination of physical and social science, sciences in this uh, report uh, uh, is really providing these tools and this uh, empirical basis for them to take action. Of course, there is more that needs to be done. We need to come up with more um, tools and data sources, but I think we are on the right track. Uh, and I, I really would like that uh, my, my co-panelists could tell something about that, but I, I really enjoy listen to, listening to Paula and to Tom and, and, and seeing that indeed, um, the, I call my, my optimism, uh, a guarded optimism. I'm optimistic. I really think uh, the challenges are huge, but we have uh, we, we have more to tools and options to address them. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Dr. Brooks? Yeah. Um, I, I think that already um, many governments throughout the world, as well as down to the township level in Ohio, are understanding this. Uh, I think that uh, Tom's comment uh, about uh, potholes is uh, revealing. We make investments in uh, infrastructure that um, must last 50 to 75 years. And so if we don't take into account climate changes and the great data that's out there now from uh, the IPCC and Dr. romero Legkow's work, uh, I think we would be highly remiss. Uh, we uh, know that these impacts are real. Uh, it's not speculative. And I think um, the NOAA planning tools, the IPCC report, can be uh, immediately utilized by local, state, and national officials uh, to, again, align our immense investments uh, to the changes that we know are going to take place. Um, just, you know, for example, um, piping uh, on our roadsides, um, our building structures uh, will have to uh, absorb more heat uh, and also um, uh, uh, shuff off uh, more cold. That means changes to those critical HVAC systems. We have to understand the nuances to that right now because we're making decisions that taxpayers 50 years from now will, you know, have to deal with. Uh, so that's, that's what I see. And I've served um, at the local level as a city council member, as a county commissioner now, but also we're engaged in eco-partnership with a sister city in Hefei, China. And even in China, they're starting to see, oh, wow, these are huge impacts. Um, and they're learning from us, and we're learning from them. So I think that's another way that uh, governing officials and in, in businesses can share um, yeah, from the local to the state to the global um, level, what we're learning we must do in terms of adaptation and we hope mitigation as well. I hope it's not too late. Uh, terrific. Tom, you're, you're talking to a lot of these people. What do you see uh, as common among those who are really successfully taking on these challenges? Well, I think what 
what I've been seeing is is a real inconsistency, uh, especially at the planning level, where you would you would hope that there's more um, recognition of of the issues here. There, it, I guess it's good and bad. There there are more. I would agree totally. There are more who are taking this more seriously, even on the pothole story. I know there's a um, one of our uh, street harbors and bridges officials has been here for years. He said, you know, I never used to think too much about climate change, but more and more, man, he goes, the the, the evidence, he goes, I, how can you not say that there's, that we're being affected? He, he described us as being in quote unquote pothole alley uh, and in a latitude of the, of the country, kind of like hurricane alley that is more susceptible to these because of how fickle you know the weather and climate can be and and that uh, you know even using good materials it's it's hard to sometimes get the full full use out of them but what I see is um, is inconsistencies I mean you, you can't expect every I mean there's a home rule thing uh, every community is going to want to naturally be able to do things differently but there are very few cities that are really taking climate change as seriously as the city of New York as Washington, you know, like Washington, some of the East Coast cities, Chicago, and and so forth, um, even even the federal agencies and the federal government, for as much as they've put into um, climate change studying, you know, through uh, through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and and uh, you know the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, EPA, and others. It's not a, it doesn't always seem to be a case where the left hand knows what the right hand's doing. Uh, case, case in point, a few years ago, uh, the US, Corps of, um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was doing a massive study looking at uh, should the Great Lakes shipping channel be widened and deepened. And I was talking to one of the lead people on it. I said, are you taking into account climate change and trying to determine years from now how you know how much uh, how much uh, dredging might might need to be done to maintain the shipping channel. He said no. I said, well, don't you think you should? He said, yeah, I do. I, I, I absolutely do. But as an agency, or you know, the Corps of Engineers even wasn't doing that. I don't know if they if they are now. Um, and and so it's a real smattering. It seems like of different agencies doing different things and and the government themselves the uh, uh, government accountability office is kind of criticized for not being cohesive enough at the federal level but then also you're looking at the other levels state townships and and the local levels and certainly all, none of them want to be dictated to what they need to be doing I, I do agree there's a greater recognition but I still think there's a big group Big room for improvement in um, incorporating that into local development plans and land shore um, land use plans, especially in some sensitive areas here like uh, Western Lake Erie, how how waterfront property is is developed, and even um, you know like cities like Finley, which uh, are very prone to flooding uh, and some of the big box development around that, you know, communities because of their hydrology, how how flood prone they are. I mean, that's going to become a bigger issue uh, if if we keep going on the path that it appears to be with more frequent uh, and more intense uh, storms. Areas that may have been sitting on the fence post for for flooding and getting by for years are going to be finding that they're being flooded, like Finley is, being flooded more often. And now in the, uh, the Finley area, uh, between Finley and Ottawa, uh, um, Congressman Latta and, um, uh, and U.S. Senators uh, Sherrod Brown and Rob, Rob Portman are, are looking at a multi-million dollar effort trying to change the whole hydrology and drainage system of, uh, of several northwest Ohio counties uh, because of the way it's been it's been developed and and how water you know flows off farms and everything. So, you know, again, I, and I'm, it's a long-winded uh, answer, but I think there's there's a big room for improvement in uh, local, regional, and national planning and.
coordination of these efforts around the, the theme of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, there are a couple related ones that I'll, I'll, I'll combine that that are both tackling this challenge that uh, you're all facing in, in different contexts, which is um, framing of uh, environment, or in this case, the climate impacts uh, versus economics as, as, as kind of a zero-sum game versus um, seeing the sustainability efficiency uh, efforts, for example, that Commissioner Brooks outlined uh, as supporting uh, rather than competing priorities. So perhaps for, for Commissioner Brooks, how are you finding those, um, uh, framing your kind of practical on the ground efforts in ways that sees those as uh, in tandem rather than in conflict? And the related question that got for Tom was uh, somebody writing kind of frustrated with how often the environmental stories are written as environment versus jobs, and how how do you, as a journalist, because the person thinks you do manage to avoid that um, that setup, uh, how how do we talk about this where it doesn't just evolve to that uh, kind of uh, false dichotomy, either or economy and environment? Do you want me to go first, or who's? Uh, sure, sure. Go ahead, Tom. Then we'll have Commissioner Brooks. Well, I. Uh... Or commissioner, if you want to go first, that's fine too. I, um, I guess I'm wound up. I'm, I'm wound up now, so I might as well go. Go <laughs> on. Uh, but um, no, and I'm glad you raised that because that was that was a point, and that that's a key point that I think it's overlooked far too often in the media is what economists call an opportunity cost, or what, or really what it comes down to, what are what are your values, society's values? I mean, I mean, certainly, um, certainly we value jobs, we value good investments, but the Western Lake Erie algae problem, for example, that's a good that's a good example of you've got the farming industry, which which you know obviously needs to have um, to have its investments and and have agriculture run, but what they're they're feeling a lot of heat now because of the the runoff from farms is considered one of the, one of the and most likely the biggest source of the um, uh, algae that's growing in Western Lake Erie and again exacerbated by by climate change. But how is one industry affecting another? Uh, how does that affect right now? The birding industry is becoming huge. Outdoor recreation. Northwest Ohio has one of you know, the most popular uh, birding destinations uh, in the country. How is that being affected? How is the recreation and boating industry? We lost 100 charter boat fish captains in one year and all of those jobs because of the algae and and the costs that it drove up uh, for their industry, so there's a spillover effect to to other industries. But it's but with the, covering the environment, whether it's climate change or a pollution spill or just regular releases, uh, you know, from power plants or or, or anything, you've got to get be get be be get past the the short-term gain versus the long, and look more at the long-term investment. I mean, what is the value that you attach to clean air, clean water, clean parks, um, having you know, a, you know, place for your kids to play uh, uh, without fear of exposure to toxic chemicals or or anything? I mean, there's a balance there that everyone is looking for a sweet spot, but uh, there has to be a recognition that. Uh, you know, it's more than what's just down on paper. It's also what you value in a in a bigger context. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so that sounds like a good place. Is that a good place for me to jump in? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I took a breath. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we when we began this journey in 2006, um, we said that uh, we could have economic growth and um, a clean environment, and there are costs. Um, you know, the IPCC takes a global view, but we looked at the costs locally. Healthcare costs in terms of higher asthma rates. Uh, the smart investments that I referred to. You don't want to rip out a whole infrastructure system that has, uh, is supposed to have a useful life of 50 years. You don't want to rip that out in 10 years and have your bonds fail. 
um, as well, uh, when we took our action in 2006, we said that growth and a sustainable environment were two sides to the same coin. And, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding. Uh, Franklin County is now the 30th largest county in the U.S. Uh, when I became a commissioner, I think we were like at 35, something like that. But we're also um, quite, we're, we're now the fastest growing county in the state of Ohio. We've taken a stand on these issues. We want clean air. We want our children to be able to breathe. We want our seniors not to have to stay locked in on high ozone days in the summer. Um, we do value those things. And I think that more and more, the officials that I work with, and I'm a leader in our National Association of Counties, I've been serving on the Energy, Environment, and Land Use, uh, Tom, uh, steering committee uh, nationally for several years. I think more and more we're seeing that um, there is a strong linkage between being cost efficient and being uh, climate or environmentally aware. Um, these are financial issues at the end of the day. They are national security issues. They are local security issues. When we have weather events that are getting more extreme, like the derecho, um, people are out of business for weeks. That hurts our economy. We have people who were injured, people that lost limbs in the derecho here um, a couple, uh, a year and a half ago. So we don't want to see that happen. Um, so there are health costs, there are quality of life costs, and there are financial costs to ignoring this we're not going to ignore it here. And quite frankly, the president um, has already uh, issued an executive order, number 13653, to be bureaucratic. And uh, all of the federal agencies are working um, side by side with um, the task force. We as the task force are all elected officials. We're kind of the um, public policy sounding board for the actions that the president has asked his agencies to come up with that will align the federal government's um, investments and activities with uh, climate preparedness and resilience. When we give our report, it will all be worked through with these federal agencies, and I think we'll have a good practical document of immediate actions as well as longer-term actions that can be taken and will work well with local uh, as well as state governments. Just to amplify real quickly what Paul said, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that the, the Pentagon has has considered uh, climate change a national security issue, and there's there's a lot of research going on with the uh, you know with the military in terms of what uh, kind of implications there are for for our national security because of uh, climate change, whether it's water resources or rising. Um, rising oceans or anything like that, but also a lot of people say in the newspaper industry follow the money as they do, I'm sure, in, in politics and, and other things. And, and I, would, I would challenge people, you know, to, to follow the money, and I know a group called Sears, uh, C-E-R-E-S, I can't remember what it stands for, but they've been doing a lot of research into how the insurance industry now is rewriting policies and adjusting for climate change. So, when, you know, when you hear people put down climate change as something that's not real, it's it's part of Al Gore's imagination or, or whatnot, you know, check and see what the insurance industry is doing because the insurance industry naturally wants to stay out in front of this issue. And Tom, if I can, Dr. DeBelco, to that point, sure. uh, I interviewed uh, NAMIC, the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. We had a long discussion about this as part of our task force effort. Um, they're very frustrated, and believe me, they are taking into account uh, climate change. Uh, and it's, it's a big issue for insurers throughout the, uh, not only our country, but the reinsurers throughout the globe. And that will have um, an impact on every consumer's pocketbook. Uh, rates are going to go up um, if, we don't, if we don't plan, as your point was, uh, and build um, in, in, in good ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, thank you both and uh, with the insurance example. And then also, Tom, thank you for um, teasing the Chapter 12 on human security that I was part of with the notion <laughs> of how our, how our security institutions are taking this seriously um, in, a, in a frame that, frankly, is quite in many ways analogous to insurance. It is a, an institution that does a lot of scenario work and risk analysis work, and they game out and understand that 
uh, uh, low probability or uncertain probability events can have very high consequences, and we can't wait around for um, some sort of certainty that uh, may never come before taking uh, important precautionary action uh, in the face of that uncertainty, and, and it's that very uncertainty that should motivate us to action rather than have us sit back and, and, and wait for wait for the next IPCC study, for example. Um, but, uh, but Patty, you know, it was interesting that both Paul and Tom talked about um, uh, the economic versus environmental, not as a trade-off, but it really um, highlighting the costs of inaction. Can you, can you um, through that frame, talk about what the, the, new, um, the new assessment of Working Group 2 in some ways highlights some of those examples for North America where, where it's not a, a either or, but if, if we don't um, integrate the understanding of what's happening with climate, that there, there will be these, uh, we're making a choice through inaction and there are costs associated with it. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, it is um, known by, by any economist that to prevent is all save us more dollars than to just respond to the disasters and to the impacts of those disasters when they already happen. Uh, I would like here to combine some findings from our working group two with findings from uh, the working group three, uh, which deals with mitigation. So uh, two key findings from the working group three that are of relevance for us in the discussion of trade-offs and uh, economic costs are first that we need to mitigate by between 40 and 70 percent of greenhouse gases between now and 250 and here we reference uh, years to 2010. So we need to mitigate by so much because if we don't do we will see more and more uh, impacts resulting from our world, our climate system, moving to an average of three centigrade uh, warmer uh, temperatures by 2050. So if we already have some examples of what might happen with extremes in the car current conditions, just imagine what will happen in terms of economic damage and economic costs of climate change. Remember I showed this map we put together in our North American chapter. We really wanted to show that North America, and particularly the U.S., is already vulnerable to existing climate variability. So again, I mean the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action. And I'm so excited to, and, and, and to uh, another point, I, I would agree um, with uh, Scott that we have a long way to go. Uh, we are faced with uh, institutional barriers and challenges, one being political will, uh, the other is uh, being lack of uh, institutional uh, and financial resources to under and legal mandates to undertake action. And of course, all the responses we are seeing just now are happen in, happening in an organic way, meaning sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. But indeed, with all the limitations, the fact that actions are being uh, taken and that uh, stakeholders as diverse as the private insurance companies and as our security uh, decision makers in the U.S. are realizing that climate change is real and will have negative implications for our wallets and for our ability to undertake uh, uh, security policies, implement security policies. All this means that the cost of action inaction is higher than the cost of action. And, and the math is, is clear, and the math was put together by both Working Group 2 and Working Group 3. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Patty. I think these um, pres three presentations, the discussion, um, and the resources and links that you all identify um, from the work that you're doing and these uh, initiatives 
and certainly the, the working groups one, two, and three of the new fifth assessment of the IPCC uh, really give us uh, all sorts of um, uh, data analysis uh, presentation in ways that uh, enable us to, uh, no matter where we're sitting, so to speak, um, take on some of these issues, have a much better understanding of um, what climate change means, brings it down from the from the height, so to speak, of the global level and the, the common indicators of global average temperature, and instead um, focus where we can on the ground with very practical responses. So I'm going to throw it now back to Scott Miller, the head of uh, CE3, to bring us to a close. Thank you, Jeff. I, I really appreciate it. I, I want to just uh, extend my thanks once more to all of our panelists. I hope that all of you uh, in attendance in today's webinar have learned something. I know I have, and we've covered everything from potholes and infrastructure to, to the loss of our fishing fleets, to asthma rates and toxic algae and all of these things. But all of these issues are coming to, to, uh, to a head to a point where we're actually starting to take action on some of these things. And, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by some of the stories that I've heard today about how we're able to take the, uh, the somewhat confusing and, and difficult to understand concept of climate change and brought it down to a practical level at the, at the regional planning level, at the local planning level, uh, at, at the, uh, making it more understandable, taking action and moving forward. I hope that you all have learned something here about ways to, to apply these, these lessons that you've learned today. I hope that you're energized. And I wish you all the best in applying these, these lessons and going forward. Um, thank you once again. If I could just make a real quick plug one last time, you're going to receive an evaluation on this webinar. If you could just take a minute or two and fill that out and send that back to us, we would very much appreciate it. I hope you've all enjoyed uh, today's webinar. And, and once again, I thank our panelists and our moderator, Jeff DeBelco. Uh, I wish you all the best. And thank you all for and have a great day. Take care.